So good evening all, I'm Lawrence O'Keefe, the chair of Friends of the Napanee River. As with all of our winter speaker series, we're proud to have partnered with our neighbors to our west, the Friends of the Salmon River. As a reminder, if you have any questions during the session, please use the Zoom chat function to type in your questions or comments, and we'll ask your questions at the end of Dr. Peregrine's presentation. Given the very large number of you calling in, we will be limiting our question and answer session to around 15 to 20 minutes. So in terms of the process, just so you're familiar with how we'll handle this is I'll do a brief introduction on our organization, running about 10 minutes. I will then hand over to uh, Dr. Peregrine for his presentation and slides. We'll have the Q&A session that will be conducted by uh, Dr. Stephen Moore from the Friends of the Salmon River. And then uh, I will, uh, conduct a conclusion. So here was the lineup for those who were not able to join us uh, earlier on uh, through our winter speaker series. But as you can see on this slide, you can watch any of our recorded sessions on our YouTube channel. Just go to YouTube and search for Friends of the Napanee River. Tonight will be our final speaker for this year's speaker series. Before I hand off to Dr. Peregrine, we would like to remind you that you can join our growing organization for a paltry sum of $10 per household. And you can go to our website to do that or uh, contact us by email or contact our treasurer. Alternatively, you can also become a member of Friends of the Salmon River and here's the information for their group. Again, if you need to write this down later or pick up on it, just go to the website, uh, friendsofthesalmonriver.ca. Well, Friends of the Salmon River and Friends of the Napanee River would like to remind everyone that you do not have to be a member of either of our groups to take part in our online or in-person events whenever we're able to get started on those once again. Before I introduce Dr. Peregrine, we thought it would be of interest to uh, provide some local perspective on the threat of Lyme disease and its rapid growth across our region over the last four years. As you can see in this illustration, which was provided to us yesterday by the Kingston, Frontenac, Lennox and Addington Public Health Office, there has been a significant increase in the incidence of Lyme disease across our region, which is significantly higher than the incidents across Ontario. Dr. Peregrine will be explaining some of the reasons for this growth in his presentation. I have a final quote from Dr. Moore from KFLA Public Health and soon to be our newly appointed Chief Medical Officer of Ontario. Uh, quote, there is no vaccine yet for Lyme disease. However, talks are ongoing for KFLA to be the site for an international vaccine trial in the coming year, Un unquote. I think this was fantastic news. So now to our featured speaker for this evening. Dr. Peregrine obtained his Doctor of Veterinary Medicine PhD from the University of Glasgow in Scotland. He then worked for nine years at the International Laboratory for research on animal diseases in Nairobi, Nairobi Kenya, where he carried out research to improve control of tropical parasites in cattle. Since 1997, he has been an associate professor in clinical parasitology at the Ontario Veterinary College, University of Guelph, where he teaches doctor of veterinary medicine students. In addition, his research interests currently include emerging parasite infections in animals and people and drug resistance in parasites in sheep. He is a diplomat of the European Veterinary Parasitology College and the American College of Veterinary Microbiologists. As a reminder, if you have any questions during the session, please use the Zoom chat function to type in your questions or comments, and we will ask your questions at the end of the presentation. I will now hand over screen share to Dr. Peregrine. Thanks, Lawrence. Let me just upload my um, file, folks. Can you see that okay, Lawrence? It's good. 
Okay, Lawrence, can I just leave, if you or if anything, if there's any logistical or technical issues, if you could just feel free to interrupt me as we go along. All right, that would be great. Um, great. Thanks, Lawrence, for the introduction. Good evening, everyone. Um, from Guelph, I'm actually in, sitting in my office at the Ontario Veterinary College. Um, thanks for joining us this evening. Just to give you a bit of perspective on, on ticks in Ontario, as Lawrence mentioned, I moved, <clears throat> I moved to Southern Ontario in 1997, and the person I was replacing had just retired. And I distinctly remember shortly after I arrived saying, what do you teach the vet students about ticks? And literally he said to me, you don't really need to bother, it's not an issue. <clears throat> and essentially that probably was true back in the 1990s, um, but things as you more than anyone will be aware have changed significantly um, since that time. And so this evening, and as, as, as Lawrence mentioned, if you've got any questions as we go along, please feel free to put them in the chat box and we'll come to them at the end or keep them until the end. So what are the things I wanted to cover <clears throat> this evening? Number one, just make sure we're familiar. What are the ticks that we can find either typically on ourselves or our pets in Ontario? Uh, and most of this will be slanted towards Eastern Ontario wherever possible. And so what are the ticks you can find? And also what, do the, what are the bugs or pathogens they transmit to people and our animals? Just to remind you, I'm a veterinarian. I'm not a human physician. Um, but I will mention some of the human data as we go along, since I think it's just as important as the animal data. I want to say a little bit about Lyme disease, um, how it presents in people, and it's quite different than the situation actually in dogs. I want to indicate that one of the ways in which the risk of Lyme disease has been changing, not only in Ontario, I'll say a little bit about all of Canada, since Lawrence mentioned there's a bigger audience, but most of my focus will be on Eastern Ontario. One of the important things to appreciate is the role of wildlife in, disease, in, in Lyme disease risk, um, because if, all, if everything's perfect for the, for the involvement of wildlife, things can change rapidly. And, and that appears to be what is actually happening in Eastern Ontario. And I wanted to finish with some practical comments about what can we do to minimize the risk of Lyme disease, both in ourselves um, and particularly our dogs. <clears throat> So first question, this is almost like a quiz. Um, this is the ear of a dog actually in the Guelph area. And my comment, question always to everyone, is anyone any idea what this is that you can see in the ear of this dog? Anyone, but it's about, it's about a centimeter or three quarters of a centimeter in length. If I was in a room with you, um, we, we go over this together, but the most important thing to appreciate, if you can see it on the skin of your pet or yourselves, and you can work out the numbers of pairs of legs, hopefully, and hopefully you can see on this, there's four pairs of legs, a total of eight legs, it essentially has to be a tick. Now, when I first came in the mid 1990s, there really was only one tick that we found on animals. And many people said, is there any point identifying the tick since we know what it always is? That was back in the 1990s. Today, um, things have changed. There's at least two ticks we most commonly see um, on ourselves. Just before I get to that, just wanted to make sure you're aware that if you look in the textbooks, there's at least seven different ticks across North America that you can find on yourselves or your pets. If you travel across North America, the common name is on the left, the scientific name is on the right. If you stay in Southern Ontario, all right, almost all the ticks you will ever see, the original tick was called the, Amer is the American dog tick. That was the name Dermacenter very obvious. And the tick that has invaded Southern Ontario essentially since the mid 1990s is the deer tick or Ixodes scapularis. And that's, those are the two ticks I'm gonna talk about for the rest of this talk. Just be aware if you wondered, is there another tick that we think is likely to establish in Southern Ontario? The tick that's a concern actually is the Lone Star tick, Amblyomma americanum. It's in New York State. It's in, it's also in many of the Northeastern states of the US. We occasionally see it here um, falling off migrating birds. We think it's gonna be the next one to establish, but at the moment there's no evidence it's established in Ontario. So 
What are the two ticks you are most likely to see either on yourself or your pets if you're outdoors? These are two pictures of the two ticks. These two ticks have not fed. And the reason I'm showing you those pictures, it's much easier to identify the characteristic features. And if you ever pull a tick off yourself or your pet, the structure to look at uh, is what that blue arrow on the left is pointing to. It's a plate, sometimes called a scutum, that lies immediately behind the mouth parts. Always look at that and ask yourself, is it all dark brown or is it multicolored? Hopefully you can appreciate that if you look at that tick on the left, certainly by comparison to the one on the right, the one on the left, the plate or scutum is multicolored. And that's the American dog tick. That's the tick that always was in Ontario. Um, so that's the one that's multicolored. And the moment that's a good tick in Ontario, because it appears that it's not infected with any bugs that cause disease in people or our pets. But that's certainly one of the two ticks you will see. Let's now look on the tick on the right. How does that compare to the one on the left, where you see the blue arrow again is pointing to the plate or the sputum behind the mouth parts, and you'll see that's all dark brown. And that tick is the deer tick, um, sometimes called the black leg tick, and its scientific name is Ixodes scapularis. That's the new tick that's come into Ontario essentially in the last 25 years. And that's the tick. I'm listening. I'm doing, watching a webinar, Hannah. And that's the tick that's associated with transmission of a bacteria called Borrelia burgdorferi. That's the name of the bacteria that causes Lyme disease. So it is very important when you pull a tick off yourself or a pet to know which tick it is, because if it's the one on the left, the American dog tick, there's absolutely no risk of Lyme disease. Of all the tick-borne diseases in North America, Lyme disease is by far the most important. And I just mentioned it's caused by a bacteria called Borrelia burgdorferi, right? And these two pictures show you pictures of that bacteria under an electron microscope. It's called Lyme disease. It gets its name because it was originally diagnosed in an area of Connecticut called Lyme. So the two ticks I've just shown you are ticks that are unengorged. Quite often, by the time we find ticks on ourselves, and particularly our pets, the ticks are, are attached and are well engorged. And, and this is a picture of a, nut, a dog um, actually in the Guelph area. Um, this tick uh, in the center is well attached to the skin of that particular animal, right? It's attached because the female tick, it's feeding on blood because it needs to produce eggs. But the characteristic feature, the plate or the scutum, is immediately behind um, the mouth parts. Uh, and is it, so it's at the bottom of the tick and the blue arrow points to that structure. And so my question to you is, um, is my dog going to get Lyme disease? Is this the deer tick or is it the American dog tick? Hopefully, if you look at that plate, all right, ignore the swollen body, look at the plates because that never changes. Hopefully you can appreciate that's multicolored. And so that's the American dog tick. That's a good tick to find since in Ontario since it's not associated with the transmission of any bugs. Mm. Here's another tick that's well fed. All right, here's another tick. Again, ignore the swollen body. Look at the plate that's indicated with an arrow behind the mouth parts. And you can see that plate is all dark brown, all right? And so it's very different in appearance. That's the deer tick or Ixodes scapularis. Here's two pictures uh, of the deer tick, all right? They have not yet fed. The important thing to appreciate about this particular tick, number one, the thing it's most likely to transmit to you or your pets is this bacteria called Borrelia burgdorferi that also causes the disease. The disease is called Lyme disease. However, it's not the only thing that that tick can transmit um, to people or pets. There's two other things that it can transmit to people and dogs. Well, um, one is a bug called Anaplasma phagocytophilum. And the third is a bug called Babesia microti. All those three things will infect people. By far, the most common in Ontario ticks is Borrelia burgdorferi, the cause of Lyme disease. Just so that you know, whenever these ticks are sent to the Public Health Agency of Canada, not only do they screen them 
for the bug that causes Lyme disease, they also screen them for the other two bugs because both of those two will infect people. Anaplasma phagocytophilum overall occurs in about 0.3% of all our ticks, and the Babesia at the bottom is much less common than that. It's there at about 0.1% of ticks. By far the most common bug infecting our ticks is the bug that causes Lyme disease, Borrelia burgdorferi. And that's gonna be the focus of the rest of what I wanna talk about. When we start talking about where has the tick spread to, where will it spread to, and where will it increase in numbers to the greatest levels, I think it's important to appreciate how the life cycle um, um, carries, is carried out and what's required for the life cycle of the tick to continue. The, so the deer tick gets its name because it particularly likes feeding on white-tailed deer. And you will often find adult ticks feeding on white-tailed deer. They're feeding on white-tailed deer to, to, to take in blood so that they can produce eggs when they drop off into the environment. So once the tick is fully fed on white-tailed deer, all right, the female tick drops off into the environment and she lays her eggs in the environment. The most ideal environment for that tick and the eggs to develop, all right, is essentially on, is brush and grass on the edge of deciduous forests. It's much less common around coniferous forest areas. The female tick, if she is infected with the bug that causes Lyme disease, if she's infected with Borrelia burgdorferi, none of her offspring are infected. They're all clean. So all the eggs she lays into the environment, the baby ticks inside are not infected with the bug that causes Lyme disease. So the obvious question is then how do they get infected? Well, once those eggs are in the environment, they hatch to release, the blue arrow is now pointing at a tiny structure called a larva. It's very, very small. I'll show you a picture in a minute. Um, they have three pairs of legs and to mature, they need a blood meal and they typically feed on wild rodents, particularly white-footed mice in Southern Ontario. They feed on the rodents because they need blood to mature. However, if that blood contains the bacteria Borrelia burgdorferi, they will get infected with that bacteria. And once they get infected, they remain infected for life. So it's wild rodents and particularly white-footed mice in Southern Ontario that are extremely important to the risk of these ticks getting infected. They get infected with the bug that causes Lyme disease, doesn't usually make them sick, but it circulates in their blood for at least a number of weeks or months so that when the larvae feed on the, the mice, they get not only do they take in blood, but they get infected with the bacteria that causes Lyme disease. Once that larva has fed, it Can you still hear me? I, hopefully you can, I just got muted. <laughs> we, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Once the larva has fed on the mouse, got its blood, it drops off into the environment and it molts. Hang on, something. Let me just go back to that. Can everyone see that? Okay. So once the larva is fed on the mouse and drops off into the environment, it molts to the nymph. And the nymph also preferentially feeds on wild rodents for blood. And if it gets infected um, while feeding on blood, it remains infected for life. So both the larva and the nymph um, feed on wild rodents, and when they do that, they can get infected with the bug that causes Lyme disease, all right? So there's two stages that can get infected with the bug that causes Lyme disease. Once the nymph is fully fed on the wild rodent, it drops off into the environment and then molts into an immature adult, and it's usually the immature adults that we see on ourselves or our pets. Let me give you some indication of size of those different structures in relation to a human thumb. The larva is indicated by that arrow. It is tiny, all right? We essentially never see it. It's only essentially present on wild rodents. The nymph is shown by that second arrow. And yes, that typically feeds on rodents. However, it also commonly feeds on people, all right? And it's thought the many, much of the human infections, probably 30 to 50% at least, are associated with the feeding of nymphs. And lastly, 
two last arrows show you pictures of adult ticks. So they're not, even as adults, they're not particularly large ticks. So some important things just to rec make sure you recognize. The larvae, the structure that hatches out of eggs, preferentially feed on wild rodents, so they need these in their environment. And it's particularly white-footed mice is where they typically get infected with the bug that causes Lyme disease. The same is also true for nymphs. If you look to the right of both of those lines of text, you'll see that both larvae and nymphs will feed also on birds. And that's particularly important when we start talking about the movement all right, of ticks all right, and changes in distribution, because one of the things that's driving that um, is bird migration, particularly in the spring. Because if a larva or a nymph attaches to a bird, it will remain attached to that bird feeding on blood for a few days. So if the bird migrates at that time, these ticks can move large distances. Adult ticks, typically we find them on white-tailed deer, but you'll find them on other wildlife species, but also ourselves and our dogs. And the ideal environment for this life cycle to develop and propagate, as I said, is associated with deciduous forests, particularly brush or grass on the edge of deciduous forests. So this is a typical picture of a deciduous forest environment. It's important to appreciate the ticks are not absolutely everywhere. So for instance, if you look at the picture on the bottom left, if you stay in the center of that trail, it's unlikely you will get exposed to ticks. However, if you walk off into the grass to the left of that arrow, ticks typically when they want to feed will walk up blades of grass and they'll wait for you or your pet to walk by and come in contact with them. Now we don't find deer ticks all, all year round, right? As far as adult ticks, these are data that were given to me by Dr. Robin Lindsay at the Public Health Agency of Canada. Uh, and this indicates that of all the deer ticks that were sent to him in 2014, this indicates the percentage of all the ticks that they submit were received in each month of the year. And you can see there's two peaks uh, times in the year when you're most likely to find adult ticks, deer ticks in the environment. They first, adult ticks first appear in the environment in sept basically September, early October. That's when they first appear. And those ticks that don't feed survive the winter essentially under the snow, and those ones then reappear in the spring. So the adult ticks we see at this time of the year, April, May, June time, those are the adult ticks that survived the winter under the snow, but they first appeared in the environment the previous fall. So I think the obvious question, what influences the risk of exposure to ticks? Number one, you've got to go outside. Number two, you've got to walk into their environment. And unlike fleas that hunt for people or pets, ticks literally crawl up blades of grass and they then extend their forward legs as that white arrow is indicating. It's called questing. They're literally just waiting for you or me or our pets to walk by and then they will transfer um, onto ourselves. Now I mentioned when I came to Canada in 1997, all right, this tick essentially had not been reported anywhere other than Long Point and Lake Erie. And then until about 1995, the only place in all of Canada where the deer tick was known to have established was Long Point on Lake Erie, indicated by that arrow, the blue arrow at the bottom. After that, because of concerns that the tick was appearing in multiple places across Canada, a system was set up where the Public Health Agency of Canada asked people to send them their ticks, number one, so they could document where they were found, and number two, they could screen them for all the bugs that infect people. And this is the Public Health Agency of Canada map for 2008. All right, and every red dot indicates where a deer tick, Ixodes scapularis, was found. So you can see, essentially, they were found right throughout southern Ontario, but already at that point, there were significant numbers being detected in eastern Ontario, also southern Quebec, throughout most of the Maritimes, and also the southern part of Manitoba. Now that was 2008, and things have been monitored ever since, and things have changed significantly um, since that time. But already in 2008, 
that was recognized to be significant numbers in eastern Ontario. Just in passing, it's important to appreciate that when this tick first appears in an area, so for instance, the Guelph area where I am was always considered free of this tick. Just in the last six months, we've started seeing them here for the first time. When you first see them in an area, it's important to ask the question, is this what's called an adventitious tick? And that's essentially a tick that's fallen off a migrating bird, or does that tick represent part of an actively breeding population? And it's important to differentiate the two because if it's the latter of actively breeding population, the risk of exposure and the risk, so the risk of contact with the tick and the risk of Lyme disease is quite different. This shows you the 2017 right, Lyme risk map for Southern Ontario. And this, was, this is publicly available through the Public Health Ontario website. This is 2017, and I'm going to take you through every map, and all of them are available online. All of the yellow areas indicate areas that are recognized endemic areas for the deer tick in 2017. And for an area to be designated an endemic area, what has typically happened is a tick has been submitted to a public health unit, and then the local public health unit has gone out, has dragged the environment for the tick, they've looked for them, and then they've gone back into the same area the following year. And once they find it in the same area, two years in a row, that's considered an endemic population. So that was 2017, where the tick was estimated to reside and be breeding. Just recognize until the mid 1990s, Long Point on Lake Erie, where that blue arrow points to, was essentially the only place where the tick was recognized to be endemic and actively established. It's since then that it's established in all the areas shown in yellow. Now, many of these areas initially um, were national parks on the northern shore of Lake Erie and Lake Ontario. And the reason for that is because thousands, millions of ticks come up into Ontario every year on the birds and my, of, on the backs of migrating birds. And they often will land in these areas before they migrate further north. So that's where many of these ticks first established, and then they've been spreading ever since. But the spread has been particularly pronounced in eastern Ontario. And so I think because of the audience I'm speaking to, I've put a green circle around eastern Ontario to help you focus on that area as we go forward in time. So that was 2017. If we go to 2018, there's been a little bit of recognized spread of the distribution in eastern Ontario. 2019, it's certainly been spreading to some extent west and northwest. That's 2020, and that's 2021 when a pocket of endemic tick has been established to occur just north of Peterborough. Let me just now take you back to 2017. That's 2017 and that is 2021. If you look southwest of the green circle, so southwestern Ontario, the range in distribution has changed more dramatically in southwestern Ontario. That's 2021, that's 2017, going forward to 2021. You can see now there's almost an endemic population right around the western end of Lake Ontario, the Golden Horseshoe area. The distribution hasn't spread as dramatically in eastern Ontario, but what has been changing is the numbers of ticks um, being found in many areas across eastern Ontario. And so the numbers of ticks being found in eastern Ontario, certainly for the last few years, is significantly greater than elsewhere in Ontario. Now, one of the drivers for what's been going on is what's been going on in the US. This is a map of the US for 2017, where every blue dot indicates a case of Lyme disease in a person that's been diagnosed. And you can see the vast majority of all the human cases, and it's true for dog cases as well, all the cases of Lyme disease are on the northeastern part of the US, not just Connecticut, but all the neighboring states as well. There's been a significant increase in the number of ticks and the proportion of ticks infected with the bug that causes Lyme disease in this region. And the relevance of that is because every spring, thousands of birds migrate from the northeastern part of the US into Canada, particularly of relevance to us 
into southern Ontario. And so they've been, the birds have been picking up more ticks, more ticks are infected with the bug that causes Lyme disease. So I think the, one of the obvious questions, and I've alluded to it already, why is the distribution of this tick changing? So what are the drivers? Well, bird migration. Now I know you will sit there and say, but there's always been bird migration. That's true. All right, um, but what has been changing is the number of ticks in the north and eastern seaboard of the US. So more and more ticks have been coming up with the birds. It's certainly true that in parts changes in the deer population, all right, the preferred species of feeding on for adult ticks, that has been increasing significantly in various parts of southern Ontario. Part of what's been driving that, though not the only thing, has been reforestation. But it's also very clear from a lot of different studies that climate change has certainly been driving, at least in part, the, the establishment and changes in distribution. So I wanted to look a little bit at some data the Public Health Agency of Canada did. Um, this is a few years ago. They did some predictions on the ideal climate suitability for Ixodes scapularis, um, particularly in Ontario, but also elsewhere in Canada. And on this map, keep an eye on the area that is red, all right? So this is for the year 2000. Um, that is considered high climatic suitability. So basically high suitability of the, hum basically the, the temperature and the humidity, all right? So it's high climatic suitability. Back in the year 2020, that was the projected um, area with the ideal temperature and humidity for this tick. As you go forward over the next 80 years, let me take you to 2020. You can see the red area has increased significantly. As you go forward to the year 2050, the red area has moved northwards, right? As more and more of Southern Canada um, has a warmer and more humid typically climate, uh, a climate that's more suitable for the tick. And if you go forward to the year 2080, it's even further north. Now that's just climatic suitability the correct temperature and humidity for the best propagation and establishment of this tick. But in addition to temperature and humidity, you need to have the right environmental conditions. And just in the last year, um, a paper was published by a group at the University of Ottawa that have looked uh, right across Southern Ontario, and they tried to predict the, the suitability of the environment for this tick. And so this is looking at absolutely everything, temperature, humidity, and the environment as well. And on this particular map, the way to understand it is explained at the bottom right. So the blue, the dark blue area indicates low predicted suitability, all right, at this point in time. So they're talking about 2019, 2020. And as you move up to the yellow, orange, and red colors, it becomes an environment more and more suitable. Now, if you look at that map, you can see there's a lot of variations in colors. Southwestern Ontario, overall, there's a lot of blue. There's a lot of suitable areas, certainly around the shores of the western end of Lake Ontario. It's patchy, but there are certainly suitable areas entirely consistent with the establishment of the tick that's been seen in the most recent years. I think for you folks in Eastern Ontario, I think what's particularly noteworthy is most of Eastern Ontario, most is considered high suitability for this tick. Not everywhere, all right, but overall there's far more of the environment that's suitable to the establishment and spread of this tick. It is patchy though, all right? So it's not too surprising that the biggest changes are being seen in Eastern Ontario because that's where everything essentially in most of Eastern Ontario is ideal for the establishment uh, and development uh, and increase in numbers of this particular tick. So that's a map about predicted suitability across Southern Ontario. To what extent is the risk of Lyme disease increasing in Ontario? Lawrence has already shown you some data, some of which I actually hadn't seen. There's a number of things that have indicated how things are changing. And before I want to talk, talk about the human disease, for many years, going back to the early 2000s, all right, ticks have been sent to the Public Health Agency of Canada. As they have a big laboratory in Manitoba where they've been screening all the ticks for the bug that causes Lyme disease and other bugs that cause 
disease in people. And this shows you the results of all the Ontario ticks that were sent to them. This is just deer ticks sent to them from all of Ontario for the years 2007 to the year 2013. So 2007, in many areas, the tick had just established. And on the right, the column indicates the proportion or the percentage of all the ticks they received, and there were hundreds of them, many hundreds. It indicates the proportion of the percentage testing positive for the bug that causes Lyme disease. And back in 2007, you can see just 7.5% of the ticks tested positive. If you then go forward just six years for all of Ontario, the figure had increased to about 18%. So the longer the tick is in the area, the more common infection typically is in these ticks. I spoke to Dr. Lindsay just yesterday, actually, asking him some up-to-date talk data for this talk. And I asked him, what typically is the rate at which ticks become infected overall now? And his, his comment was, initially now, when ticks first establish, typically somewhere between five and 10% of them are infected with the bug that causes Lyme disease. However, now within five to seven years, certainly in some areas, you can have as many as 30 to 50% of ticks infected with the bug that causes Lyme disease. So the longer the ticks are around, the more likely they are to be infected with the bug that causes Lyme disease. Let me give you some overall figures, and these are publicly available data that I was able to get on. If you look at what's called passive surveillance for all of Eastern Ontario, so that's just all the ticks that were taken by members of the public to public health units, right? If you look at all those ticks in Eastern Ontario, on average, about a quarter of them were infected. However, that's an average and there's significant variation around that figure. There's a paper that came out recently on the Kingston area for 2019, 31% of those ticks were infected. And we've known for quite some time that if you go to Long Point on Lake Erie, and this is back in 2009, this is where the ticks have lived the longest, all right? Um, typically back then about 60% of the ticks were infected. Now those figures for Eastern Ontario certainly do not indicate the maximum um, proportion of ticks that have been detected infected. And I want to show you some of those data. Perhaps I think the most interesting data on Eastern Ontario um, was published just two years ago um, by researchers at the University um, of Ottawa. And what they did, they looked at all the ticks that had been picked up by what's called passive surveillance. So that's people dropping off the ticks at public health units and all the ticks the public health unit received, right? All of them were sent to the Public Health Agency of Canada lab in Manitoba, and they were all screened for the bug that causes Lyme disease. And in this particular diagram, there's four maps. All right, they're all of Eastern Ontario. Just to give you some orientation, the lo approximate location of, Ot of Ottawa and Kingston on each of those maps is indicated on the one on the right. All right, and then what they've done is they've divided Eastern Ontario's three public health units into what are called the forward sortation areas. And so those are areas where the postal code, the first three digits are the same. All right, so it's been divided into postcode areas. All right, one area, everybody has the same first three digits in the postcode. All right, they haven't used higher resolution because of concerns about confidentiality. So these are all the ticks. These are the ticks they received and then the proportions of them in each of those areas that were positive for the bug that causes Lyme disease. Just so that you understand the differences in color, all right, the black box that I've just highlighted here indicated how to understand the colors. At the top of that scale, all right, the yellowy color is no ticks were detect infected. The very light beige is zero to 20% of the ticks were positive. And then as you go up to the very dark area, that indicates 61 to 100% of the ticks they received were infected with the bug that causes Lyme disease. Let me just make sure you understand each of the maps. The blue arrow on the left indicates the map for the year 2010. And then to the right of that is 2011. To the right of that is 2012. So the map on the right that has Ottawa and Kingston indicates the 2012. And then the map at the bottom on the left indicated with the green area is 2016. And it probably 
You can see the progression over time, particularly as you go from 2010, the top left, to 2016 on the bottom left. Back in 2010, you can see there were certainly some areas where none of the ticks were infected. There were certainly some hot spots around the Ottawa area, but over time, from 2010 to 2016, the proportion of infected ticks, particularly in the southern part of Eastern Ontario, has increased significantly. Please just note some of the forward sortation areas are very large. It doesn't mean that that proportion of infected ticks was true throughout the whole area. It could be just because the ticks were submitted from one area, but typically overall, there's been an increase, not only in the numbers of ticks that we've been seeing throughout much of Eastern Ontario, but the proportion of infected ticks has been increasing. And since 2016, it's been bouncing up and down right, ever since, but it's been staying pretty high. So that's the risk of exposure to ticks. We're seeing more ticks in many places in Eastern Ontario. More and more of the ticks in many areas are infected with the bug that causes Lyme disease. I think one of the obvious questions is, is the risk of infection in people in Ontario changing? Well, Lawrence actually has already answered that for you. Um, but before I talk a little bit about the human data, I think it's important just to say a little bit about what Lyme disease looks like in people. So number one, the tick must feed on you. And as you'll see a little bit later, it typically has to feed for at least 36 hours before it can transmit the bug that causes Lyme disease into your skin. The most common things that happen typically in the first month is the development of a large red circular, sometimes it has a bullseye appearance rash. Uh, and by definition, it has to be at least five centimeters in diameter. That skin lesion develops in typically somewhere between 60 and 80% of people. And it usually develops one to two weeks after the tick um, was feeding. So it's a lot larger than a common bug bite and it develops much more slowly um, than, for instance, a mosquito bite, all right? But that's the usual appearance and it's associated with the bacteria multiplying and spreading in the skin. After that, the bacteria typically then progresses to local muscles and joints, uh, and people in the first month can complain of muscle or joint pain or what feels like flu signs. And all of that typically happens in the first month. If the infection is caught in that early stage, typically the infections uh, in people and in dogs respond very quickly to treatment. However, if the bacteria then spreads around the body after that, it can be much more difficult to treat. For those of you that have concerns about dogs, dogs usually don't develop the skin lesion. They usually develop significant lameness, but that doesn't happen until two to five months after um, the tick is fed. Most dogs actually never become sick. They're relatively resistant um, to disease by comparison to people. So, that's the disease. To what extent are the cases now being diagnosed and reported? Well, some years ago, Lyme disease was made reportable in Ontario, and that is cases have to be reported. And so when anyone goes into a physician, what should happen is, number one, if there's any suspicion about Lyme disease, number one, you should be looking at a map of Southern Ontario with the areas where the deer tick has known to have established. And there's three definitions of Lyme disease, what are called confirmed cases. The first definition is indicated here, you've gone to a doctor and they've confirmed that you have that large red skin lesion. It's sometimes referred to as erythema migrans, all right? Not only do you have that, it's been seen by a doctor, but you have a history of living in or visiting one of these yellow areas all right, in Southern Ontario, uh, where the tick is established and there's a risk of Lyme disease. That's called a confirmed case. A second type of confirmed case is that you go to a physician with clinical signs consistent with Lyme disease and they've done a test on you that actually detects the bug in you. That has to be reported as a confirmed case. Like, lastly, if you go to the physician and you have any clinical sign consistent with Lyme disease, and they've done a blood test that indicates you have antibody, 
and you live in or travel to one of these risk areas, that is considered a confirmed case. Those all have to be reported. Now, you may be saying, well, hang on, we know that the risk of exposure to the tick is changing over time, so that map must be slightly out of date every year. And that's true. And so because of that, there are also what are called probable cases, and that's the first and the third definition on that slide, without any history of living in or traveling into one of those areas. Probable <laughs> cases must be reported as well. This slide indicates all the Ontario cases of Lyme disease, all right, and the nut for 2000 in green for 2017. This is all of Ontario and indicates um, for each month of the year uh, when all the cases are being diagnosed. And you can see overall, almost all the cases are being diagnosed between May and October. The vast majority are between June and August. In Eastern Ontario, 70% of all the Lyme disease cases being reported are in those three months. That's when the cases are being reported, June, July, August. I think the obvious question is, so when are those people most likely, when were they most likely fed on by a tick? Well, the reality is most people will go to the physician with skin lesions, flu-like signs, aching, uh, aching uh, sore muscle or joints. And all that occurs within the first month of infection. So most people in Eastern Ontario are getting uh, infected, fed on the tick between May and July. So what about the number of human cases being reported now through in Eastern Ontario? Uh, Lawrence has actually already sent me that sent you the data. Um, these are the data for the same paper as before from the folks at the University of Ottawa. The number of human Lyme disease cases, and that's all the confirmed and probable cases for the years 2010, all right, through to the year 2016. All right, and the maps are exactly the same as before. The top left map with the blue arrow behind it is the map for 2010. Each of the maps are divided into the forward sortation areas. That's areas where the postcode is the same. So the, the, the forward sortation area is where everyone has the same first three digits in their postcode, All right? And as you go to the right along the top, you go from 2010, 2011 to 2012 on the right. The right just reminds you the approximate location of Kingston and Ottawa. And 2016 is shown the bottom on the left with the green arrow. The colors, all right, how they, what they represented are indicated by the black box that surrounds the colors. Where there's that white yellow color, no diseases of Lyme disease, cases of Lyme disease in people were reported that year. So if you look at 2010, quite a lot of Eastern Ontario, that was the case. But as the color, the brownie red gets darker and darker, you can see the very light um, brown is 0.1 to 6.2 cases per 100,000 people. And as you go to the very dark brown, that's up at 80 to 165 cases per 100,000 people in the population. And the change is very similar to what I described as far as the proportion of ticks getting infected. And that is over time, as you go from 2010 to 2012, down to 2016 um, at the bottom, the risk of human people being diagnosed with Lyme disease has increased essentially across the whole area, but particularly in southern parts of eastern Ontario. All right? And if anything, it's going to keep increasing as we go forward. And the data that Lawrence showed you confirms that. This is the geographic distribution of those cases. So I thought I'd just finish just with a few practical questions. This is what I give the vet students. All right. Uh, and this is a pictures of a few ticks with the question, will you or your pet get Lyme disease? So first thing to appreciate or ask when you pull a tick off, number one, is it the right tick? And we'll come to that in a second. So is it the right tick, the one that's associated with the risk of Lyme disease? The next question, if it is the right tick, has it well fed? Because they need to feed for at least 36 hours before they can transmit the bug that causes Lyme disease. All right, so the overall proportion, um, of all, the overall proportion of all the ticks in Eastern Ontario infected, all right, in 2016 was about 23%, all right. However, there are many areas in Eastern Ontario 
where the proportion of all the ticks is sick, if they're infected is significantly higher than that. So before we, uh, I give you the final, final quiz, a few things I just wanted to mention, what are some of the things you can do, all right, with your dog and yourselves to reduce the risk of Lyme disease? And I realize many of you in areas that are seeing significant numbers of these ticks. Number one, if you have a dog, all right, do remember dogs like yourselves only get infected if they're going outside, all right? However, there are now a lot of good tick products that you can get the, um, from your veterinarian particularly, some given orally, some can be given topically, uh, and you should discuss um, what's the best um, tick product and how much of the year you should be using tick prevention. My understanding, a lot of the vets in Eastern Ontario are now recommending year-round tick prevention for your pets. That's what the primary focus should be to eliminate the risk of Lyme disease. For dogs, there are also a number of Lyme vaccines. All right, and so in addition to using tick products, talk to your vet about whether your dog would be a suitable dog for vaccinating for Lyme disease. Um, it's really interesting to hear Lawrence say um, there's an increasing discussion um, about development of human Lyme vaccines because that would change the world once they come on the market. So tick prevention, vaccination of dogs for Lyme disease. But the other thing that's just as important, and that is every day after you've gone out into a tick area with your dog, check the dog for ticks, all right? Because if you check the dog every 24 hours for ticks and pull them off before they've fed long enough to transmit the bug that causes Lyme disease, you can essentially eliminate the risk. If you go to Connecticut, which has had Lyme a lot longer than we have, Everyone is used to living with the ticks and doing daily tick checks, not only on their pets, but also themselves. Whoops. So, sorry, whoops, something happened there. Number one, what can we do? If you read all the leaflets about what you can do to eliminate risk, one of the classics says, be cautious when you're walking um, in woods, avoid bushy and grassy areas. I appreciate that is easier said than done, but just appreciate when you walk off into grassy areas, you're increasing the risk of exposure to these ticks by comparison to staying on um, paths, all right, where there is no grass. Ideally, ideally, you should wear long pants tucked into your socks and long sleeve shirts. And the reason for that is typically ticks, when we walk past them, will transfer onto our legs somewhere between our knees and our feet, all right. If we're wearing long pants, they'll transfer to the pants and they'll start walking upwards. Right? And we're more likely to see that if we have long pants, they'll keep walking up us until they come in contact with a skin area. Now there are, and we might talk about this afterwards, you can buy some chemicals to put into clothes. It's the one that's most commonly used is permethrin. And you can get clothes that are impregnated with a drug called permethrin. Not only is it a tick repellent, but it also kills ticks if they attach. You can do that. Just be very, very careful that you never let those pants come in contact with cats. Permethrin is extremely toxic for cats. However, you can put less toxic things onto clothes. For things like DEET uh, are a lot less toxic for cats than permethrin. So, if you are not wearing long pants, ideally apply an insect repellent such as DEET on the exposed skin. It greatly reduces the risk of the ticks transferring onto you. And then like your pets, every day when you've walked into a tick area, so that's typically at the moment, every day inspect yourself and family members along with the dog um, for the presence uh, of these small ticks because they're usually a lot smaller before they've started feeding. The areas you are most likely to find them around the base of the scalp, all right, in the armpits and the groin. If they're able to, that's typically where they'll, where they'll walk up to and they'll attach. If you find them, ideally um, remove them. Um, if they've attached for the while, they may be quite difficult to pull out. Grab them by the mouth parts right by the skin and pull out. If you don't want to do that, go to your physician or your local public health unit. So final um, pictures to ask you the questions, will I or my dog get Lyme disease if you found that on yourself? Hopefully, if you appreciate, if you look at that particular tick, you can see the scutum right behind the mouth parts is multicolored. That's the American dog tick, all right? 
um, that is not uh, associated with the risk of Lyme disease. So that's a good tick to find on you. And that tick has not fed either, all right? What about this particular tick? Is that the right tick? Is that the deer tick? Or is it the American dog tick? Hopefully you can appreciate the plates behind the mouth parts is all dark brown, all right? So this is the deer tick, but it's not fed, all right? So even though it's the right tick, there's absolutely no risk. What about this tick? Is this the right tick? Is there a risk of Lyme disease? Hopefully, if so, you, you can appreciate this tick is very, very well fed. I don't think I've seen such a well fed tick before. Don't let the body throw you. Look at the plate behind the mouth parts. It's all dark brown. That's the deer tick. So it's the right tick. It's fed long enough. And so the question is, um, could it have been infected? Well, depending on where you are in Eastern Ontario, Overall, it's about a quarter of the ticks, but in many areas, many more than that infected. So it's quite likely. So go to your physician, your public health unit with that tick if it's come off of you. So I hope that was helpful. Um, hopefully I've indicated how the risk um, of exposure to the deer tick and Lyme disease has changed, particularly in Eastern Ontario in the last few years. Um, the risk of your exposure very much depends on your lifestyle. And we've mentioned many of the things that you can do to reduce the risk of exposure to the tick and the risk of infection, both in yourself and your pets. I'd just like to thank all these people that have allowed me to present some of their data, folks from the Public Health Agency of Canada and Public Health Ontario. The most up-to-date risk maps for Ontario are always available on the Public Health Ontario website. I hope that was helpful. I'm more than happy to take any questions. Lawrence. Thanks, Dr. Peregrine. I'll hand over to Stephen Moore, who will manage our Q&A session. Stephen, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Lawrence. Um, well, that was just excellent, Dr. Peregrine. I was um, a bit worried about the number of questions I would have to field uh, with 235 participants, but uh, you did such a good job. Actually, you ended up answering many of the questions. I'll just review some of them that uh, that came through, if that's uh, okay. Um, I thought you were very good about identifying ticks. I feel much more confident about identifying um, a good tick and a bad tick. A couple people have mentioned an app called eTick. Do you have any experience with that? And is that necessary after really what you've given us today? Uh, yes and no. <laughs> So <laughs> ETIC, I, I spoke to actually Dr. Curtis Russell, who runs the monitoring for Ontario just this morning. He's with Public Health Ontario. And he said that ETIC, is, it's now federally funded, all right, and they're handling a lot of the surveillance data, all right. And so, um, yeah, they have a website. Uh, and my understanding is it's very reliable and helpful. Mm, okay. So, uh, I, you know, sometimes, sometimes I think um, our eyesight perhaps isn't as good as it used to be. <laughs> uh, uh, and I'm certainly finding now, unless I use magnification, all right, I sometimes struggle. Um, and so sometimes I'm unsure. Fortunately, where I work, I've got magnification. But, you know, if you're ever uncertain, um, it's always helpful, helpful to use eTIC. And I'd encourage you actually to submit information because it's a monitoring system now that's funded by the federal government for all of Canada. Yes, I think that's good advice. I was surprised at how, how small the ticks were. Yes. Uh, they're not all that easy really to no. identify without magnification. There were a couple questions about um, other vectors. Uh, you mentioned white-footed mice in the uh, life cycle. Um, any evidence that chipmunks are also part of that? There's, there's, there's a lot of evidence that a lot, many different rodents can be reservoirs of the bacteria. All right, um, even birds can be. Mm -hmm. Typically they never make them sick. It's just white-footed mice it seem to be the, the species that the bacteria remains longest in its blood. Okay, and there were a couple of questions about Canada geese. Um, I know that they can be a problem at some shorelines. Are they, uh, uh, do they drop deer ticks? So, so just remember that, the, so not a, you've got to have ground dwelling birds all right, who are gonna come in contact with the tick. So, I mean, the question is to what extent are the ticks in the areas where the geese are? And I'm well aware that those Canada geese get absolutely everywhere, mm. all right? So certainly because they're ground dwelling birds, there's a possibility the ticks could establish, could, sorry, attach and move with them as they fly. 
Mm -hmm. Now, um, you also mentioned that they're much more um, prevalent uh, in grassy areas next to deciduous uh, forests. Do they ever drop from trees or are, are they mainly in the grasses and they come up from below? So I, I'm well aware of people, I, I get this question quite a lot. There's minimal evidence that they, have, that, that they ever crawl up into trees because typically they want to stay at a height where they're most likely to come into contact um, with, with you or an animal, right? Mm -hmm. I, I've, I've, Stephen, I've given up saying things never happen, but <laughs> if it does happen, it's extremely rare. Ah, right. You also mentioned that uh, temperature and humidity seem to be playing a part in uh, the, the the hot spots. I'll call them. Is there any evidence that pollution um, also plays a part in the prevalence of ticks? Whew, that's a so off the top of my head, I don't know. However, having said that. Like, so depending on what the environmental impacts are of pollution, I suspect that when there's pollution, the environment is less favorable. Mm, okay. Oh, that's a big generalization. All right, and I think that's something that we have to look at. But do remember, if you don't have, if you don't have the right, you, so it's not a deciduous forest, if it's not bush grass on the edge of that, it's not ideal. It doesn't mean it won't happen. It's just everything seen, the reason everything's changing dramatically in Eastern Ontario, unlike anywhere else, anywhere else in Ontario, your environment and the climate seems to be ideal, more ideal than anywhere else, mm -hmm. sadly. Okay. And I know you mentioned, um, well, I've heard in terms of removing a tick, I've heard uh, matches, uh, kerosene, hopefully not at the same time, um, tweezers, uh, and tick keys, and it seems like the tick key is a handy little device for removing them. Do you have an opinion on that? Yeah, I mean, there are, so there are a number of things that clearly work, and there are a number of things that can be dangerous. Um, kerosene <laughs> or cigarettes, and I, uh, can, right. be, can be particularly nasty, because I, and I've seen over the years a number of dogs with cigarette burns on the skin from people trying that. So don't do that. All right, the best way to get them out is either with tweezers grabbing the tick. And I think I had a picture. Sorry, I'll just get to that. So that's it. Yes. Grab the tick right by the skin. And again, that's easier said than done if you don't have fine um, tweezers or forceps. And then pull it out slowly. There are tick removing devices, which we quite commonly use on dogs, which work effectively like um, tweezers slowly pulling the tick out. If you're ever concerned that you've left bits in, all right, what eventually typically will happen is an abscess will form and all the other bit in the mouth parts will come out um, in the pus that forms. But if, if you ever have concern, so if you ever have concern, go to your physician. Before you get to physician, you just rub some alcohol over it. And whenever you're pulling ticks off, try not to hold the tick with your fingers because there is a risk. So for instance, where you are on Af I mean, in many areas, two thirds of the ticks are infected. And the last thing you wanna do when you're pulling the tick out is have your fingers around it, squash it, and end up with the bacteria on your skin. And so ideally, so if you're using fingers, use gloves. If you're not able to use gloves, wash your hands immediately afterwards, whether or not you have a cut. So it's a theoretical risk getting infected through the skin. Um, it's very, very rare, but it is something you can eliminate if you're just sensible with the way you handle ticks. Mm -hmm. Very good. Now, at, at least two people are taking baths, which I think is a good sign. And, and they've mentioned uh, finding engorged ticks in the bath water. Um, is a hot bath aversive to ticks? Is that, a, would they back out in a hot <laughs> bath? I think, so the answer to that, Stephen, I think it depends on the tick, all right? Um, and, and the reason I mentioned that over the years, that ticks, we know ticks breathe through their outer surface, all right? And over the years, it's been suggested if you cover them in nail varnish, if you cover them in Vaseline, they can't breathe and they'll come out. There's certainly some ticks, if you do that, they will come out, particularly if they haven't attached for long. But I know many ticks, I've seen it where people have done that and absolutely nothing's happened. Mm -hmm. what, what I would say, Stephen, and I didn't mention this, is 
if you shower, one of the best prevention strategies, and bear with me, is showering daily. And the reason, so the reason I say that, and I, this comes from personal experience living in Kenya, where three times I found ticks on myself. They were well, they were well attached and well engorged because you often they'll use an anesthetic so you don't feel it. All three times I found a tick while I was showering. So it's not, it's not because showering um, removes the tick or anything. It's just when we shower, we, we are very good at knowing what's us and what's not us, where our lumps and bumps are. And literally all three times, I, I won't tell you where, but I found the ticks literally from sharing. I felt them and thought, that's not a mole. And I looked and there and behold, it was a tick. So one of the benefits, not only is hygiene of sharing every day, it's a very good indirect way of finding ticks on ourselves. Yes, right. I can understand that. And also, uh, you know, having a tick check with our partner is uh, yep. always quite a bit of fun, too. Right. And, and, you know, if you've got a pet that goes outside, a dog or a cat, you should be checking those every day. Mm -hmm. Do do moose, are moose susceptible to deer ticks because they're a similar species? So I'm not so I don't know. But what I do know is there is a there is a tick called the moose deer tick. The moose tick. It's another dermacenter species that looks very much like the American dog tick, so the good tick. There's a similar one that spends the whole winter on moose right across Canada. And in the spring, if you ever see moose, you'll often see them covered in ticks, and that's the tick you'll find. I mean, I wouldn't be this tick will feed on moose, all right, but in the grand scheme of things, they're not they're not that important. Is, is there any evidence that ticks are becoming more hardy as well as uh, increasing prevalence? I don't know, Stephen. I, I don't know. And what conf is confounding that is that the, the environment, the climate is changing significantly in their favor. Right. That's, and that's is there any evidence of people becoming immune as a result of being infected with or without treatment. So, I, so I'm a vet, Stephen. Mm -hmm. I know from the animal side, there's no evidence that if dogs get Lyme disease, that they're immune to reinfection. Mm -hmm. right. um, and that's always, that's, that's one of the big challenges with a Lyme vaccine, all right, is making sure that it protects there used to be the Lyme vaccines for people, I think until about two decades or so ago, and then they were removed because of concerns about side effects. And, and since then, we've had a number of Lyme vaccines developed for dogs. All the companies that develop those know there is a big human market. And most, my understanding is most of the work is going into ensuring safety, all right, in people. So I'm not surprised. I was, I'm, well, I was surprised to hear Lawrence talk about a field trial, but I'm not surprised to hear that maybe one of the companies has got that far. Because once we have a Lyme vaccine, it's going to be like a COVID vaccine. It's going to change. I know particularly for you folks in Eastern Ontario, it's going to make a difference in the world once you have a Lyme vaccine that we can use in people. Mm -hmm. Now, will colder temperatures in the winter have an effect on reducing the population of ticks or are we past that are our winters typically now too warm to kill off many ticks so the winter so typically the winters don't kill off the ticks they survive you know in the upper layers of the soil under the snow the snow actually acts as an insulation blanket what we do know is, so usually we don't see ticks. Just, now, I better be careful here because I know Eastern Ontario is very different from where I am. But quite commonly, once you get to the end of December, January, February, early March, we rarely see ticks unless, excuse me, the daily temperature goes above about five or six degrees centigrade. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. You, so and so up. So where I am, it's very rare that we will see ticks in those months, and so we don't usually recommend tick prevention for dogs. But I'm well aware in eastern Ontario, many of the vets there are starting to see ticks during the winter months, which is why they now recommend tick control right throughout the winter months. So I would ask, to be honest, the people with the most up-to-date data will be your vets. Right. Mm -hmm. um, they will know to what extent are they seeing ticks on dogs during the winter months. And it's very patchy. 
as you go through East Montero. But if you look forward, you know, the next 50 years, we're going to start seeing more ticks during the winter months and significant numbers right throughout the winter, sooner than later. I would expect that, yes. Now, someone mentions a tick called a hunter tick, which is quite large and moves fast. Have you heard of that kind I, of tick? I haven't. I'm sorry, Stephen, I don't know that. It must be a local name that I don't know. I'll okay. look into that. So I would guess in summary, you know, if you see something on your dog that you that you may think is a tick, try to remove it carefully or go to your vet. And if you see something on yourself that you think is a tick, try to remove it carefully or go to your doctor. Or your public health unit. Mm -hmm. And it's the public health units actually, Stephen, that have had the budget to go out screening the environment for these ticks. So the one thing I would point out, you might have noticed in the maps I showed, oh, sorry, is, am I, is, is Lawrence's slide still showing? Uh, yes, Lawrence is, is on now, but- So he, boot, he managed to boot me off, which is very did, good. Yes. <laughs> but Stephen, what I, what I was gonna say, Stephen, I, you may or may have not have noticed, there was almost no change throughout all of Southern Ontario for 2021 by comparison to 2020. And I asked Dr. Russell this morning from Public Health Ontario whether, whether perhaps that's biased by COVID. And he said, absolutely. Because uh -huh. all their people who used in the public health units who would have gone out looking for this tick, um, A, have not been allowed to, and B, many of them have got hijacked to work on COVID issues. Mm -hmm. So right. um, the latest map is not up to date and they recognize that. Well, uh, well, again, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Peregrine. I mean, I feel much more well educated and, uh, and I'm sure that many of our uh, listeners do as well. And I will now turn it back over to Lawrence. Thanks, Thanks Stephen, that's great. Um, there were a number of, of uh, suggested links and other suggestions that folks uh, have listed. So once this is, uh, session is complete, uh, I, I'll start working on the recorded uh, session. Uh, for posting and sending out notices tomorrow. And in that note, I will also include some of the suggested websites and other suggestions that folks had. Uh, and finally, I'd like to hand over to Susan Moore, president of the Friends of the Salmon River for a few moments. Thanks, Lawrence. Uh, I have to say when Lawrence first came up with the idea for this webinar, he sent me an email with Peregrine in the title. And at first glance, I thought, Hey, Lawrence spotted a peregrine falcon. Oh, cool. <laughs> oh, and then I said, I looked, uh, looked at more deeply and said, oh, right, it's a Dr. Peregrine, the chicken lime guy. Okay, that's great. By the way, I'm still waiting for the peregrine falcon email. I want to thank Dr. Peregrine for an enlightening presentation. This was such a thorough explanation of ticks and tick distribution and Lyme disease. It will be immensely helpful to our audience of 245 and many more who will of course see the recording of the presentation. I think in particular, knowing how climate change and movement of wildlife fit into the picture is such a benefit to know. And also to know that there is monitoring and this kind of research in place for how the scenario is changing over time with particular conditions and over large areas. It's so valuable to have the experience of a specialist in parasitic infections, especially because Dr. Peregrine is able to give us his long view from years of study. So it was a fabulous presentation. It really illuminates the hard facts of ticks and Lyme disease. And it's a real prompt to all of us to be vigilant about ticks as they're part of life now. With tonight's information, we're much better armed for the battle. We are grateful to Dr. Peregrine for spending this time with us. Thank you from Friends of the Napanee, Friends of the Salmon, the Stewardship Councils of Lennox, Nattington and Hastings, and all of the 245 people who tuned in. As we draw to a close, folks, it's almost time for the nightly tick check, so make it your mission. Thanks, and back to Lawrence. Thanks, Susan. So finally, Friends of the Napanee River and Friends of the Salmon River, we'd like to thank you for joining us for what was a very successful speaker series this winter. As I mentioned earlier, if you're interested in seeing any of our recorded events, you can find them by going to YouTube and searching for Friends of the, of the Napanee River. 
Thanks to all of you for joining us this evening and we sincerely hope that you, your friends and families remain safe. Have an enjoyable and tick-free summer. Thanks, Lawrence. Please feel free, if you've got any questions that come along afterwards, please feel free to get in touch. Will do. Okay, bye for now.